Welcome to Dose of Support, a podcast for healthcare professionals to preserve stories and provide a dose of support to each other through community and shared experiences. We're going to share successful and sometimes not successful self-care methods. And I'm your host, Dr. Vanessa Casper, a nurse practitioner and a professional just like you. Remember, I'm hosting this podcast, but I'm not your healthcare provider, and my guests aren't here to provide healthcare advice either. But we do encourage you to seek out care from your own healthcare professional. And although we're sharing stories from healthcare, I intend to fully adhere to HIPAA and protect privacy. And remember, this podcast is not related to any employer. It's hard out there, so let's find some self-care in healthcare. Stay tuned, everyone. Well, hey, listeners, let's huddle up again for another check-in this week. I'm coming off of a lovely weekend outside. We visited my sister and brother-in-law at their cabin. And we were able to socially distance and hang out outside and just be on the lake and feel the breeze. And it was just beautiful weather. I took my little guy out in his swimsuit. It was just the cutest. And then if any of you follow us on social media, you'll see that I posted some skincare ideas for self-care Sunday. And you'll note that I am looking for the holy grail of a sunscreen and a tinted, like a tinted sunscreen that's also a moisturizer because I don't wear foundation and I have very fair skin, so I need to have sunscreen. And really, everyone that's listening to this should have some good sun protection, especially during these summer months where we're all outside a lot more. Um, so I got a couple of really good recommendations from Dr. Haley Laku and Dr. Carrie Baki. So thank you guys for reaching out and participating on Self Care Sunday. But also, if anyone has that holy grail of like that triple threat where it's SPF and tinted and a moisturizer, DM me, send that my way. I'm still looking for the good recommendations that are out there. Um, This week, we are going to talk to Danny Gonzalez, who is a hospice nurse. And before you cringe, hospice is really scary as a word for some people. And in my work, I talk a lot to patients and families about how really hospice enhances quality of life. And so that is our goal with this episode, is to do a little bit of teaching and learning for anyone out there. I hope you enjoy the episode and stay tuned. Welcome back to Dose of Support. Today we have Mr. Danny Gonzalez, a licensed vocational nurse, or LVN, with more than 10 years of outpatient care experience in various areas of healthcare. He brings his unique experience as a male, Latino, and today he'll share a story from his work in hospice care. He calls himself the last responder as he ushers people out of this world. Welcome, Danny, to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Awesome. I'm so glad that we could connect today. Um, Danny, tell me, what is a licensed vocational nurse? I think that there's a lot of different kinds of nurses out there. And so tell me what your training was like and what a LVN is. Sure. So an LVN is, is a nurse. Um, you know, we, of course, there, we know there's RNs out there and there's us LVNs. Um, the schooling, of course, is a little bit different. Um, they, they, RNs definitely go through a little bit more, um, topics and items, I guess you can say during their schooling. Um, LVNs can do quite a bit of what an RN can do. Um, however, there are some things that RNs can do that LVNs can't, of course, um, due to their training that they have, it's a little bit more in depth, like I had mentioned. Um, so my schooling was actually in Corpus Christi. Um, I went to uh, Kaplan College, which is a vocational school. Um, I went for an, a whole year. Um, although that may not seem like a long time, it was a 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. program Monday through Friday um, for wow. an entire year. Wow. No breaks. No breaks. Um, I think we had like a week off for Christmas and like two days off for Thanksgiving. And it started in September, ended in September. And we were in school literally five days a week, every single week. Wow. Wow. So when you come out of this program, do you just start working or is there a test that you need to take? Sure. So yeah, so we have to take an NCLEX um, similar to what the RNs take. It's called the same except ours is LVN and theirs is RN. 
Um, and it's basically an overview of questions of our um, of what we learned throughout the entire year of school. It goes from basic nursing knowledge to pharmaceutical questions to math questions that we need for nursing. And um, it's, it's a standardized test in the sense that all OVNs take it, um, and it and, and the state puts the questions in there. So no matter what school you go to, you should have the same basic knowledge on how to be a nurse. Right. So you have to complete X amount of training hours sure. before mm-hmm. you can even sit for the boards. And then the boards are a national test. So everybody takes the NCLEX PN. And um, so it should be a very standardized across the board, similar in all states test. And then you get issued a license after you've passed your test. And it sounds like that went swimmingly for you. So this was over 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Most uh, nerve wracking few days of my (laughs) life actually waiting. And we actually found a loophole on how to figure it out early. So I'm glad I did because I think I wouldn't have waited the extra four days. I would have gone crazy. (laughs) So what made you interested in healthcare in the first place? You know, I was a restaurant manager um, for quite some time prior to being a nurse. Um, I'm 32 now, so that would put me at 22. I was a restaurant manager from 17 up until 22. And my stepmom actually went to uh, medic uh, medical assistant school. And one night I was just fed up with work and I had no idea what I wanted to do next, to be completely honest. And a pop-up came up and it said, go to school to become a medical assistant. So I did. I was like, you know what? I'm trying to change a career. I want to do something different. So I did. I became a medical assistant and I graduated, took a test. Which is, and, I mean, like that's oh. a whole different job too. Like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> medical assistant is totally different. And hopefully we get to cover that role here on yeah. Dose of Support as well. But it sounds like you were like, yeah. I'm going to try that. Yeah. So I did for three months and the lady next to me, the nurse next to me says, you realize we're doing the same thing and you love what you're doing. And I was like, I do. And she goes, go back to school and become an LVN. So very next day, I went to school, got accepted into the LVM program about a week later. Uh, I quit my job um, and I went to school for an entire year um, as an LVN to get my LVN. Do you think that because you were 22 at the time, you were able to just make that snap decision at the drop of a hat and just like go with the wind and like, would you, yeah. would you do that now? No, absolutely not. I mean, right? I still, I still lived at home at the time. I mean, I didn't have very many bills. I mean, the money I was making was just fun money. So it was kind of like, oh, I had, you know, some money set aside and I can do this now. Let me just, let me just do it. You took the opportunity. That's awesome. So it sounds like your your family kind of influenced you to go into the direction, and then you had some coworkers that were like, "Hey," and mm-hmm. supporting you. That's correct. Awesome. So then you you pass your boards, and then what? Um, so I passed my boards, and prior to passing my boards, I was already volunteering with a hospice company in Corpus Christi, um, and I kind of knew at that point that this is something different that I wanted to do. Um, but at the same time, I also knew that I had lots of friends and colleagues that worked in nursing facilities. So passed my boards um, and I already had a job waiting um, since we had done clinicals during the last few months of school. Um, they were able to potentially offer us a job the moment that we passed and I already had a position available and I took it. So literally I got my my results and I started work like three or four days later. That's awesome. That's what every new graduate wants. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So um, when you say nursing facility, for everyone listening, um, Danny is talking about a skilled nursing facility, what used to be termed as or still is to some people termed as a nursing home or a rehab facility. Um, and then tell me a little bit more about the hospice company that you were contracted with and volunteering with. Yeah, so it was a it was a newer company, if I'm not mistaken, ten years ago in Corpus, and um, it it I was part of the inpatient unit, so I was just sitting with patients um, prior to even becoming a nurse as a volunteer, and then once I passed, I also started working as needed with them in their unit while uh, patients had to come in for crisis mode or crisis care um, in that unit. Okay, all right, good. Good. So our paths crossed somewhere along the lines, and I don't even know where in your journey, but you, after you became a nurse, it was this up and down, uh, lots of life changes for you. And do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, for sure. Um, 
So let me see. So I became a nurse um, and then I was living in Corpus um, and my job offered me a position in Austin. So I literally two weeks out, literally in two weeks, I jumped from Corpus Christi to Austin, Texas, and they moved me. They gave me money to relocate and everything. Um, at that point, um, I and this is going to me being a gay male nurse. Um, I was definitely not out in Corpus Christi. I was still pretending to be straight, I guess you would say, or, or not really sure. just showcasing being gay. Um, and then never had a boyfriend or anything. And then I moved to Austin and um, it was a little bit freeing for me in a sense of not living in the same um, city as family and just being able to be my own person. Um, so I came to Austin. That's actually where I met you and Lisa. Um, <laughs> Shout out to Lisa Stradwick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we became great friends um, and we worked together for quite some time. And, you know, after since that moment, um, life changes, like you said, happened because I met somebody, we got married, uh, we I got divorced um, all throughout, even knowing Lisa and, and you, I think y'all were with me for pretty much all of that. Yeah. Um, so lots of life changes have happened in the last 10 years from just becoming a nurse to, to growing as an individual. I also think that nursing helps you grow as that individual, but, you know, seeing life, seeing the profound parts of life and seeing the gifts that you have and to live your own life the, at, at its fullest it sounds like, you know, you, you knew that you were different and it sounds like when you kind of left the nest, you were able to blossom and become your own person. And that's really, really special. And I hope you feel like Austin was a supportive place for you to do that. And for folks listening, that's Austin, Texas. Yes. Um, yeah. There are multiple Austins <laughs> out there. Um, so, and, and we we used to live down there as well and as people have heard in subsequent episodes i have quite the minnesota accent and <laughs> um but sometimes people might hear that i say y'all and it's because i lived in texas so i just uh, you know thank you texas it's the one thing that i can't shake is y'all um <laughs> that's awesome so, so danny are you still in the central texas area then Oh yeah, so I live. Um, my boyfriend and I of he, of two years, uh, we actually live here in San Marcos, Texas, which is slightly about twenty minutes south of Austin, Texas, um, in a little house that we have rented um, with our four dogs. Oh wow, four dogs! I mean, mm -hmm. I knew that about you, but I'm still just like, wow, the dog poop. Like, yeah. I just... Oh no, 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 no. We actually, we actually hired somebody <laughs> uh, once a go. week to come and pick up the dog poop because there is just too much for us. To... I digress. Okay, Danny. So, as an LVN, what is do you can you explain the difference between an LVN and an LPN with a P? Okay, yeah. So the difference between the LVN um, and the LPN would be. There's actually, to my knowledge, there's no difference. It's actually just depending on where you're located in, in the United States, because some parts of the United States call LVNs LPNs, and then some call LVNs L. Yeah. So, I, to my knowledge, there's no difference. Great way to explain that. I do believe that it is regional. There you so, go. That's the word. Yep. So, like a lot of southern states, an LPN is an LVN, and a lot of northern states, an an LVN would be an LPN and it, they're interchangeable. I believe it's the exact same exam. Yep, um, the, the license that the state issues you has a different letter in it, but it's the same role. And so just for people out there listening that are like, I've never heard of an LVN or is there a difference? There really isn't a difference, but it is regional and it's just how nursing formed in the United States over time. So yep. I, d I did want to make that distinction. And then I have a couple questions about your heritage because you're a Latino guy mm -hmm. and you live and work in Texas where there's a large Latino population. And so there's different cultural aspects to caring for folks that are of different cultures. And um, I, if I remember correctly, you do not speak Spanish. Is that right? <laughs> I can understand it pretty well, but speaking is, yeah, I'm not very fluent. <laughs> But luckily, you have a good understanding of, of the culture because of your own heritage. So can you speak to that a little bit? How does your background help you take better care of the Latino population in Texas? 
Sure. So I know, um, just of course, being Latino, just knowing the the way that our culture kind of sees nursing or nurses, and especially in hospice, knowing that, you know, in, in the city that I'm in, in San Marcos, when I go see a patient that I know is Latino, just because either the demographic sheets, I know when they say we have family, I know I'm expecting to see sometimes a larger family than I would in other different backgrounds. Um, I also know that usually they like to, you know, I, there's just so many cultural differences with like Latinos versus other cultures and every culture has their own thing. And just knowing, I, I don't know how to explain that. I just know my culture well enough to know how to communicate with them the most effective way, because I know my family and I know the way we want things done on a medical side. And I, and I, and I feel like a lot of us in this heritage kind of have that same feeling. So that's what I want to learn a little bit more of. So for example, like what are some what are some things that you would do differently for a Latino patient? And it's not necessarily do differently. It's just bringing up topics and situations differently. Like I know the Latino heritage likes to, and, and it's just the way we, everybody in the older generation mainly were raised was they, they want to care for their family as long as they can at home. Um, not to say that that's the right way, not to say somebody else or another heritage is a, is a right way. Just knowing that in the Latino family style that taking care of your loved one at home as much as you can is what they want. So having the conversation about possibly going to a nursing facility is, is going to be harder to speak to that on the Latino side because they also feel a lot of times Latino families are bigger. So they feel like we have enough family that can come together to to help care for them 24-7. So trying to find the walk around to say, hey, look, it's not going to work at home, but we need to get to a facility. Um, and and having that conversation coming from somebody in my background is maybe a little bit easier than maybe somebody in a different background speaking to somebody in the Latino heritage uh, in that sense. So that's one thing. Um Another one is, of course, religious preferences. You know, not to say all Latinos are one religion, not at all, but um, a lot of them are Catholic. Um, and knowing their religious preferences, being Catholic and things like that helps. Um, it definitely helps um, with the the process on talking about religion. Um, so, you know, growing up Catholic, I, I know how to talk about different things that maybe Catholic religion may want to talk about, if that makes sense. Yeah, that um, does make sense. And like offering last rites with a priest and right. things like that. So understanding religion helps you relate to the patient, even if you don't practice that religion. I have found that that's been very handy for me as well. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for speaking to that because I think that there's, I mean, there's food, there's religion. Oh there, yeah. There's, there's just so, so much. much um, yeah. Weaved into that. And I think that because because you are of that heritage, you can really serve patients in your area better um, than like a white girl like me from Minnesota. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and what's also I want to point out is that we actually also talk about the different cultures and heritage when we go through class for LVN. They do also have questions on our national tests about the different cultures and the different heritages to make sure that we have that broad an experience. Awesome. Awesome. So what does, so you currently work as a hospice nurse, correct? That is correct. So what does a day in the life, you have two jobs though. So what does the day in the life of, of Danny Gonzalez look like? Sure. So um, my day is uh, every other week, I'm actually on call for hospice after hours. So the moment that 5 p.m. hits and the office closes, I'm on call from 5 p.m. until 8.30 a.m. the next morning. Um, that's Ooh. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then on Friday, 5 p.m., I actually stay on call all through the week until Monday morning, 8.30. Um, the best thing is then I'm off for an entire week after hours and I have nothing to do all day. So I love to work. So I do have a second job as well. So during the hours of nine to five in between my calls, I actually work as a contact tracer for COVID um, with the state of Texas. That is awesome. That's so important. That work is so important. Absolutely. Tell me what the average day before you were taking call for COVID patients, what did, what did, let's say you get calls from, from hospice, mm -hmm. what, what happens? Sure. So we have a call center that the calls go to and every family member is aware that we are open 24 seven. So 
family member, the, the patient falls, um, they, you know, have a skin tear, uh, they show signs of a UTI, they start coughing, any change at a facility or a family member at home sees in their loved one, they call us. Um, at that time, the, the my, our answering service um, gives me a call. They give me all the information. I then call back the family and see, I triage the situation. Triaging is basically getting a, a feel of what's going on and seeing what I can do over the phone to assist the patient. Because sometimes there's not a visit needed um, and it's something that can be handled over the phone with the family and then, and then we're good. So at that point, I call the family, find out the situation and assist as much as I can over the phone. If it's something that I cannot assist with over the phone, I get rest, dress in my scrubs and I head to the patient's home. Um, so what are what are some examples? So it sounds like over the phone, maybe you could advise the family to give a dose of morphine or sure. you could advise the family to reposition or do some oral care or something like that. But what would make you like, oh, I better get there? What yeah. makes you put those so, scrubs on? So the things that, that make me say, oh my gosh, I need to go is, hey, my family member fell, hit their head and they're still on the floor. Um, at that point, we don't want them to touch their loved one until we know um, what the situation is and and are, that they potentially break their hip, that they potentially fracture something. Um, so at that point, I get on my scribs and I go. Now, we're talking about Austin, Texas. So we know the traffic is horrible. It's horrible. You yeah. guys, I can attest. It's like the new LA. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So we know that already. So our ETA usually is about an hour. Um, if a patient's on the floor and 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 we advise them to potentially call two one one or three one one to help get their loved one off the floor, and that's when the the fire trucks will come and assist the patient off the floor. Now, so for folks that are out of state, not every state has a three one one or two one one number, and so in Danny's area, that is like the informational non emergent number that you would call. Right. So that's why he's saying that number and not 911. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so, you know, so, so, you know, falls with injury is something that we definitely go out for. Um, my, you know, my loved one is having issues breathing. Um, I don't know how to give the morphine. I'm not sure what to do next. Can you please come? Absolutely. Oh, so okay. we definitely do that. Now I do preface by saying that when we do admit, we let them know we are not a 911 service. So I cannot be there in 15 minutes. Um, right. so the families, you know, have to acknowledge the fact that there might be something that I ask you to do over the phone in the time that I'm getting there to make your loved one comfortable. Um, so that's what I do. I triage, ask them to do something and then I head that way. Okay. So, and then you get there and then you treat the patient, make them comfortable. And the goal with hospice is comfort and mm -hmm. quality. Is that right? Absolutely. 100%. Yes. You want to keep that person out of the hospital, even if they have a fracture. Sometimes we decide to keep them out of the hospital and just treat their pain because they're close to the end of their life, perhaps. And so um, that's why you go to them instead of them going into a hospital, right? Absolutely. And the one thing that we do have at every home is do not call 911 first, call hospice. And that way, if it's needed to call 911, then we will advise you at this point, we feel like it is best for you and your loved one to call 911 because we are not able to manage at this moment and get there fast enough, which does right. not happen often at all. Right. Sometimes there is a reason. I have sent people that are on hospice to the ER because they're actively like they cut their arm open when they fell and I'm not physically there to suture them up and I, I need them to stop bleeding. So I, Absolutely. For, for some reasons, there are reasons to send a hospice patient to the ER. But um, for the most part, we try to treat them on site in their home, make them comfortable and give them quality time with their family. And I think that hospice has evolved even in the last 10 years. I think hospice is no longer this like at the very end of your life, you get on hospice. I think that hospice is now this thing that we can, it's a service that we can give people well before they're within that six month window. I mean, they have to qualify that they could, that they, you know, that they have to have a qualifying diagnosis that deems them eligible for hospice services. But after that, they just qualify for the service of having that extra care. And so that's what I try to tell people when I have a conversation with my patients and their families. I say, 
listen, I don't know when you're going to die. I, you know, it could be six months from now. It could be five years from now and you would graduate from hospice, but you qualify for these services based on your diagnosis. And so I like to talk about hospice in that way. It doesn't have to be like you sign on hospice and the, the patient dies two minutes later. Um, it really should be more of a preventative thing. Agreed 100%. Um, the sad thing is, is that a lot of patients that we get, it's within their last few weeks of, of life um, because the family has a pre, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, has a pre-notion of what hospice, what they feel like it is. So they don't want to do it until the very last minute. So a lot of patients that we see don't have a lot of time because the family has waited until the moment where they actually need it. And now we're in crisis mode and, and, and it's sad and we're doing as much education as we can to get them to exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And so, uh, so I work in primary care and we do a lot of these conversations and I think that a lot of providers don't want to quote, give up. They think that hospice is like throwing in the towel when really hospice can be, can be something that prolongs a quality life. Like we have seen people sign on to hospice and they're still on hospice two years later because they're doing well and they're living their, their best life that they can. And so it can really, if we just look at it through a different lens, I I really, I really wish that the healthcare community as a whole would look at hospice differently. It doesn't have to be that last minute sign on, get those services. It can be like a year ahead of time and get everyone ready and usher that person onto the next part of their journey. Um, so I know that's a little soapboxy, but that's, <laughs> um, Tell me, do you see hospice nurses on TV? No, not a, no. Actually, I do not. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think of like a movie where there was a nurse there, and I, I can't even I, think I, of one I, either. I know, and it's like, like nurses are always misrepresented in the media. In my opinion, we're not represented enough, and when we are represented, we are misrepresented. But hospice, it's already misunderstood, even among educated healthcare professionals, which is why Dose of Support exists, right? Like we're trying to, we're trying to come together, learn about each other, and then find solidarity together. And once people know what it is, they can utilize it better. And so if we saw it in the media, maybe we would get, you know, enrollment sooner before there's more suffering. And so I'm, I wish that we could come up with an example, but I'm really no, I can't trouble. think of any. Yeah, same. Um, there's a new, uh, there's a new show called Knives Out. Huh. I don't, I don't know if you've seen seen it on. I think it's on Amazon, and there is a nurse in that show, and she does home visits, and she's administering like IV morphine at home. And I'm just like, huh. that's. <laughs> totally not what happens exactly um, but that that's kind of close to like a, you know you would do a home visit you would give medications you would make someone comfortable you would assist with their activities of daily living you would provide a lot of education right absolutely yes yeah yep absolutely okay. is there anything funny in, that you do in your life because you're a nurse like washing your hands before you go to the bathroom Oh yeah. Before I go to the bathroom, I have to go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> every time I see a sanitizer station anywhere I go, I, I'm always sanitizing. Um, and then of and course you're all before COVID, right? <laughs> yeah, like absolutely. <laughs> before COVID for sure. Um, the other funny thing is always, uh, you know, if you eat chocolate and you see chocolate somewhere and you have no idea, is it chocolate or did you actually bring that from the facility somehow, some way, uh, of, of, of poop. So yeah. Poop? That's always something. is it poop or is it chocolate? <laughs> yeah, that's that's my biggest thing. Is one day I opened up my nursing bag, and I had left a candy bar in there without realizing. I don't even know why there was a candy bar in there to begin with, um, and it melted. And I was like, okay, so it's chocolate or is it poop? I have no idea. So yeah, oh that bag, yeah, that was an interesting day. Anyways, uh, <laughs> all right. 
I think parents everywhere are like, yeah, is that chocolate or is that (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) All right. On that note, we're just going to take a short break and we'll be back with some stories from Danny. the show we have Danny Gonzalez our licensed vocational nurse and hospice nurse with us and he is going to share a couple of profound moments with us from his practice Danny go ahead sure um so you know doing this for almost eight years with hospice nursing in general has has definitely been plenty of moments um some of the ones that stick out you know is is there's been there's been a couple of times especially one where we had a family call in the middle of the night um, that their loved one was having a hard time breathing. Um, of course, I asked them to please administer morphine, um, which they did, um, and I let them know I was on my way. Uh, luckily, this patient was only about 25, 30 minutes from me. So when I got there, they had already had family gathering around, and the patient was still alert enough to like still know what was going on. But she also knew that she was getting ready to pass. So you know, I got there. We allowed her to get a little bit more comfortable her family was there and you can just tell the love in the room. And, and she passed peacefully moments later, uh, probably about 20 minutes after I arrived, just knowing that they had the, the opportunity to call a nurse in the middle of the night, ask what to do. We were able to triage it over the phone, get them comfortable. I was able to get there and even be there for her last moments. You know, that was definitely I, people always ask like, how do you do it? And my, my biggest thing is, our goal is to make people comfortable. And that's exactly what I did that night is I was able to help with the orders from the doctor to help get that patient comfortable enough to, to, to be there with their family, to pass peacefully in bed. And when that happened, that's just a moment that shows me that this is what I love doing. And it's so weird to say that I love it because you're, you're helping, you're helping those who are at their end, but at the same time, we're all going to be there. So I rather make sure that that is the most comfortable transition then it'd be painful and long and agonizing. So I'm sitting here like nodding my head because I think that death in our culture as an American culture is just really viewed at this, as this really bad thing or this thing to fear or this thing to avoid. Um, and it sounds like, you know, you are, are seeing it head on and acknowledging it and helping people to accept that death is part of life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is a hard thing to, when we have been told and, and even subliminal messaging about how to avoid death and that it's, it's almost like we, we avoid it. We avoid talking about it. It's not part of what we do in America. And um, because of that, we have people that suffer longer, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think part of your role is helping people come to that realization that it's normal. It's normal to go through that process at the end of a natural life. Yes. Um, And so it sounds like you have hard conversations all the time. And Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, they definitely are. And it's hard to, there's also family members who are not very accepting of it. And and just having to have the conversation like, this is what's next. And this is how we're going to help, you know, make sure they're comfortable. So, you know, it is hard to have the conversations, but they're definitely necessary. And they're on service for a reason. And that's why we're here. So as a last responder, do you ever do postmortem care? Yes, often. And is there, I, I mean, you don't have to talk about your own spirituality, but have there sure. been moments after someone has passed on and their body remains where you have felt a little like a spooky moment? Because I have, I have, and that's why I'm asking. So no, it's actually interesting you mentioned because I don't know why or of what it is, but sometimes you can feel when in this, I don't know how to say this correctly, but you can you can tell the spirit of an individual sometimes whether 
there was negative or positive energy and, you know, energy can go both ways, but you can just sense the, the death as being a positive or more of a negative. And I don't even know where that comes from or how to explain it, but there's just a feeling you get this weird feeling and, and sometimes it's nothing. And sometimes it's a good feeling. It's just, it is weird. Not weird. It's different. It's a different feeling. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. And I, I think other people that are listening may have worked in these types of situations before, and they might be nodding their heads along with us, but um, there is something spooky or, or spiritual or weird that um, when you are with a patient after they have passed and you're caring for their body, um, because that that's the dignified thing to do, right? Death is <laughs> not, it's not glamorous. And um you want to make sure that someone's body is clean and, you know, that they are in a dignified way when they go to the funeral home. And so that's part of the role. And I think that when you're with that patient, um, I, I have done postmortem care a lot myself and I, I have talked to the patient the whole time. Um, especially since I have that same feeling, are they still in the room? Is there some weird energy? Um, and not to get like woo woo on people. And I know everyone believes something a little bit different. Um, but it, there is like an energy in the room and I, I can't explain it. I agree. Same. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad it's not just me. Nope. Okay. So along these lines like you see a lot of death it's like kind of your gig it's kind of, it's kind of yeah. part of the deal with hospice and it sounds like it's it's very therapeutic and it's a very peaceful um but i imagine that it's also hard so my question for you is how do you cope with the hard things that you see and what are some self care methods that you um try to try to do yeah so um my 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 biggest thing is on my weeks off of on call i i try to just shut myself off of hospice in sense of i turn off my emails i kind of get myself a break um because it is it is a lot and it can be a lot you know um we do have chaplains and social workers who are open and all available for us to talk to at our company um along with friends who work within the company you know having the conversations with them about how we feel um, I also work out. So going to the gym, taking my mind off of things helps me cope with just the, the death part of it. Um, the, the thing with my role and it, and it doesn't make it easier, but I don't necessarily have the opportunity to attach myself to the patient, like a case manager who sees them on a weekly basis does for so many months. I'm usually there towards my mom or family member has passed. And I do the, what's called the death visit. Or, and sometimes I've never met them before, and this is the first one. So although I'm not saying that I'm cold to it, I'm saying I'm not attached in a sense. So it's a little bit you didn't easier. didn't know them personally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a little bit easier for me to go in there and do what I was, I'm, I'm wanting to do and not feel so much of a burden, but be there for the family and still have that emotional connection. I don't know how to say that appropriately, I guess. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I think that you've done it because when you care for someone over a long length of time, you do form a bond with them, a good connection. And when you haven't done that, then it makes more sense that their death would not hit you as hard yes, as maybe exactly. someone else. Now, I do have patients that I've seen for three years because they've been on hospice somehow and their doctor is certifying. And those are definitely harder because I've made a connection and I've seen them after hours so many times. So yeah, it's 50-50. It's so you exercise, you decompress and, and get away. You kind of unplug. Um, yes. Is there anything else besides, you know, four dogs? I guess you got to walk your four dogs. You got a lot. To, oh, yeah. You got a lot of distractions. Oh, yeah. um, and it sounds like your employer also offers something to help staff. And I think that is so important. I don't think that all employers actively have that. No, they definitely do not. I think that most employers say that they do, but they don't actively promote that there is help. And so it's awesome that your employer does and you feel like you can reach out to the chaplains that you work with. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us what you do every day and for doing the work that you do, because it's not, it's not my jam. 
Um, <laughs> and, and also for sharing your, your self-care methods. I think that someone like you sees some hard stuff and if it's working for you to, to work out, maybe it can inspire someone else to get out there or talk to a chaplain or, um, turn off their email or their phone. So, yeah. um, it's so good to connect with you. And if, if listeners want to connect with you, where can they do that? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I have Facebook, uh, Instagram, and I think that's pretty much all I have. Um, but my Instagram handle, it's kind of funny because it's Dr. Gonzalez 87. However, everybody thinks it says Dr. Gonzalez. Um, it's just my middle, <laughs> it's my middle initial as R and I did it when I was in high school and I never changed it. So now I get called Dr. Gonzalez often and I do correct them. Oh, that's awesome. um, but yeah, so Dr. Gonzalez 87 is either Instagram or Facebook. That's awesome. And if anyone out there listening wants to connect with me, I'm at hello at doseofsupport.com by email. You can find us on Instagram at Dose of Support. We have our private Facebook group where you can discuss any of the things that came up today. Um, and it's just called Dose of Support, but you just have to answer the questions to get in. And then um, we also have a website, www.doseofsupport.com. And there you can um, submit a story if you want to be on the show. And it, that just comes directly to me and I review them. Um, you can email me there if you're, you know, waffling back and forth on something. You can look at our previous episodes and see what they're about. And um, you can also donate to our Patreon. The Patreon page has a $5 and a $10 Patreon pledge. And if you if you sign up for either of those, you really get to give input to the show and ask questions from uh, to to the guests that are coming on the show. And thank you so much, Danny, for giving me a dose of support today. And listeners, we will see you next week. Stories matter, and now we've captured another one. We'll be back next week with a brand new guest and a whole different story. Until then, make connections and give each other a dose of support. Dose of Support is written, produced, edited, everything by me, Vanessa Casper, with exclusive music by Rafael Sequeira. Don't forget to rate the show or leave feedback wherever you listen. I'm punching out until next week, where we try to find some self-care in healthcare once again. Music